Hi everyone, I'm Selma Karashi. Welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, the University of Texas San Antonio's Neuroscience Research Podcast. Today is December 2nd, uh, 2021, and we're talking with Serjan Antic. Is that how you pronounce your name? That's how I pronounce it. Okay, thank you. Who is Associate Professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Connecticut Health in Farmington. Um, so uh, Surgeon is a, is a pioneer in optical imaging of single cells using voltage sensors. He's been leveraging that technique layered with calcium and sodium imaging, electrophysiological recordings, and computational models to get at fundamental um, biophysical properties of dendrites, their role in synaptic integration, uh, neuronal excitability, and the generation of up and down states. So joining us today are Todd Troyer. Hi, Todd. Hello. And Charlie Wilson. Hi. Hi Charlie. So, um, so did you, you talked to us today about how um, local glutamate-mediated plateau potentials generated in a dendrite profoundly change global electrical properties and excitability of a neuron. And you, you walked us through a series of biophysical events that, that cause a single plateau potential um, triggered in one basal dendrite, like really, really localized. Um, to depolarize the soma and then shorten the membrane time constant, you know, do all these things basically that ultimately make the cell more susceptible to being triggered by um, other afferent inputs. So that activated up prepared state, as it's as you variously call it, then offers a synchronizing window for other um, neurons in, in a network to form ensembles. You sort of theorize about that. So we could spend 45 minutes on many aspects of this, but I want to linger for a minute on the technical feat of investigating voltage waveforms of dendritic potentials occurring in response to spatially restricted um, glutamatergic inputs in, in vitro in slices. So can you just say something about this prep and also just why voltage sensors are the only way to do this kind of experiment right now? Uh, voltage sensors true. are... Thank you for asking this question. and. Uh, they're not the only way. Actually, there are people on the planet Earth that can patch thin dendrites. And that has been done and has been published. Um, the only thing is that it's very difficult to, to get them and it requires a lot of energy and resources. And um, these experiments have not been re re uh, repeated on a regular basis, which I assume is because they take so much time and energy. Uh, voltage imaging is easier because you have access to the cell body. That's where you deposit a fluorescent voltage-sensitive dye. The dye diffuses into dendrite, and you see voltage waveforms. So that's the reason simple why I'm using what as simple as that. So it has the advantage of allowing you to see multiple places on the dendrites, even though there are people who can patch dendrites. Maybe some people can patch two places on the dendrite. Almost nobody, I think, can patch many, many places on the dendrite at the same time. Excellent point. But uh, even your method is, has some restrictions, right? So the, the imaging sensor uh, has to be fast. So that means that it can't, I mean, my understanding of imaging sensors is they can be fast or they can be large, but they cannot be fast and large. Large meaning signal size. Uh, large meaning having lots of pixels. I see. So the, you're talking about the detectors. Yeah. So the, the camera that we use for voltage imaging is true, has very few pixels. So we sacrifice the spatial resolution to have these really crude pictures of only 100 pixels by 100 pixels, which is plenty for what I want to see. And that's how you get speed. So we can see the, an entire piece of dendrite in the soma in a 100 by 100 pixel Oh yeah, right. so now that yeah, we are now discussing the magnification. Yes. So you, you can magnify the image in such a way that it fits your, your camera visual field, depending on the magnification. Yeah, that, that can do, uh, that can be So done. then the, the number of places along the dendrite that you can collect a signal is determined by the size of the region of interest that you create when you're analyzing the data. So I guess in principle that could go down to one pixel Except one pixel, one pixel may not have collected enough photons. Exactly. So yeah. uh, let let uh, explain this for people who are watching this. Um, 
So when, when we finished imaging, we end up with every pixel responding to voltage depending on what is projected onto the pixel. But if you just take one pixel output, you see there is a lot of optical noise in it. So you do much better if you take a segment of a dendrite and select uh, 10 pixels and you spatially average them, that would improve signal to noise, reduce the noise and keep the signal at the same size. So we almost regularly use spatial averaging from that region of interest. And what I report as a point is actually a voltage across over 20 micrometers of a dendrite. And of course, voltage is sort of smeared in the dendrite because voltage um, is electrotonically communicated to nearby regions, so it should be continuous. I wonder what the, in an ideal world, when we could have any spatial resolution that we could ask for, what we would find is the best spatial resolution that for getting all the information out of it. I'm kind of wondering about the, the density of differences of voltage along the dendrite that matter. Wow. So, uh, for example, let's forget about the dendritic spines, mm -hmm. and let's believe that all dendrites are cables that are with a, with a uniform diameter from the place where they juncture with the cell body to the final tip. And in that case, you can use biophysical modeling and figure out what is the grid that you'd like to work with. And I'm almost certain that there will be no interesting questions that would require a grid that, a grid that is uh, better than 10 micrometers per second. So I that, cannot imagine what would be a, a, a biological question. So the reason I'm kind of... Uh, sneaking up on the question, of, because one of the cool results is that a group of nearby synapses would act together to create a plateau, which would make an upstate. And the cells have to be nearby. And so nearby is a, kind of an approximate word. We don't know exactly what the spatial requirements are. All right, now you are introducing the lithic spines. Now the resolution has to go up. Once you introduce dendritic spines and you know that you can get um, maybe even 10 dendritic spines in 10 micrometers, ideally, if you want to forget all of the limitations of technology and just say, I, ideally, I want to image, of course, I want to image, I want to have 10 pixels per dendritic spine. So it would be right? worth it to continue to uh, try to get higher and higher spatial and temporal resolution out of these voltages. Actually, we have examples in the literature where a person whom I worked with, his name is Dayan Zecevic, is imaging voltage in dendritic spines. So he does that at high resolution, and you can see... You can do that by zooming in. So you could zoom in maybe on a little piece of dendrite that was directly under where you're puffing on some... Glutamate, in this case, in this cavity. case, they would uncage. Uh -huh. Once you work with single spines, you'd like to uncage glutamate, and they they combined glutamate uncaging and voltage imaging, and the paper has been you know, published. The reason I'm interested in this is it has to do with uh, the logical properties of the dendrite. So in your in your scheme, firing is sort of an and operation. It's an and operation between a cluster of synapses that created an upstate and other synapses that could be distributed that don't have to be clustered that could be causing the timing of individual action potentials. And so the, the, um, the logic of the, of the neuron in that situation is still pretty simple. It's just there's this and there's that. But you could imagine lots of different kinds of this and lots of different kinds of that. And those would all be equivalent in some sense, right? So any other cluster that caused a plateau would also cause an upstate. It would be as good as all clusters are as good as any other cluster and make an upstate. Uh, if you impose that question on me, if, ev if all clusters are equal, the answer is no, they're not. Uh -huh. Clusters that are closer to the cell body are more powerful. If you have a cluster which is at the tip of the basal dendrite, this guy cannot keep a cell body in a sustained 20 mil depolarization. I didn't say that at the talk, but the depolarization will be of a smaller amplitude. Still the same shape, but smaller amplitude. Because the attenuation of the signal along the dendrite will determine that. 
So the, the, mid, the middle size of dendrite is the one that gives you what I, what I showed. So but don't you, wouldn't you have a, then uh, with different uh, levels of synaptic input along the dendrite, you would have interaction between whether they could be a cluster and get a depolarization. So even if you had something distally, it would presumably make it easier for something less distally to go switch into the upstate, right? So you'll actually have a, it's not like you have individual things. Cooperation. Yeah, so you'll you have, cannot, yeah. Cooperation is uh, uh, the most likely scenario, yes. So that's, um, that's a little bit like the standard view of the neuron, which is that it takes some cooperative group of inputs to make the cell fire, but the number of cooperative groups that are possible on a cell that would make the cell fire is enormously large. Like, if, it takes a, if a neuron gets 10,000 synapses and it takes 100 of them going off at the same time to make a spike, then the number of possible inputs that would make a spike are, you know, the, the number of combinations of uh, 10,000 things taken 100 at a time, and that's astronomical number. So the neuron seems to be not very particular. <laughs> Many things that would make it fire. So one of the attractions to some of these more logic-oriented ways of thinking about the neurons is it kind of reduces the, the scope of what the neuron does so that, so that you could tell more about the world by looking at the firing of that neuron, right? If, it's, if there's 10 to the 30 different combinations that could make the cell fire and you see the cell fire, you don't know much uh, about what made the cell fire. But if, but if the neuron was organized into subunits, and each one of them had a thousand synapses and took, you know, a hundred. And then those things interacted with each other like a like a logic circuit. Then you could sort of draw out the logical expression for that neuron, and you would tell it would mean something. So for for interpreting the fact that a neuron fires, one of the most fundamental questions seems to me is: Is the neuron a selective thing that's really looking for something specific in its input, or and you could tell a lot by when it fires, or is the neuron not that selective? Not, I mean, maybe even astronomically unselective <laughs> the way we normally think about it now. To me, it's, it seems like a, a crisis. It's a sort of intellectual crisis when thinking about neurons that our usual everyday street model of how what makes a neuron fire, the kind that we teach to undergraduates in neurobiology class, just seems untenable to me for the reason I just said. It's just too many different things can make the neuron fire. And the, the cluster idea pleases me because, because, that, because, it's a, because now that group of synapses is a unit that represents something, right? The bad thing about it is that you need to track all the axons in that cluster back to their neuron of origin and discover that, that all those cells have some functional relationship with each other. Good point. And, uh, of course, practically that experiment isn't uh, very easy to do. It's not, but this is the theory that we are uh, entertaining at the moment, that, uh, that you can find um, the reasons why uh, certain glutamatergic inputs are segregating onto one part of the dendrite. Hopefully there is a reason and it's based on the content of information that they are triggering. So they are part of a network that, as I said, will be activated due to a class of objects. And the class of objects could be people, houses, cars, and uh, uh, fruit. But then, uh, then that's it. They, 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 and when that network is firing, certain branches that, that are receiving a lot of input uh, light up and then pump current into the cell body so you get a sustained depolarization of the cell body. And that's the priming that is necessary to come close to the action potential firing, which is the, the threshold for action potential initiation in the axon. So now that you have put on the verge of firing, little tiny things that come as uh, additional pieces of information begin to drive the cell uh, easily 
and not so easily if the cell was on the resting memory. And then hopefully there are not too many different kinds of those. Uh, because if there were many different kinds of those, once again, we wouldn't... You mean classes of objects? I mean, uh, uh, different combinations of the little tiny unclustered inputs. The distributed inputs. The, in the distributed inputs. We would we want them to mean something too, don't we? I mean... We no, I would... Uh, so uh, you do not want to restrict an analog system such as the brain. Uh, you want to allow it 10,000 different uh, things hitting you on the same time because that would increase your power of, of thinking and the repertoire of your behaviors. And another thing that, um, that you said that you dislike, and I say maybe you dislike that there's an infinite number of combinations that can be used to fire a neuron. And uh, what if this is a built-in feature of the nervous system that prevents it from collapsing? So if you have a... Uh, you build a wall and the wall is made of uh, bricks of the same size and you put them together on top of each other, you just push that wall and it falls down. But if you have bricks that are of different shapes when they, and you put them together to make a wall, it's a much sturdier wall. So they come in all different shapes. That means it's more difficult to break down the system. That's my understanding why neurons have this so complicated so many possibilities so that so that the, the analog system continues to work even if there is some resetting signal that will completely wipe out the conscience for two seconds that doesn't happen that that's my my thinking so you use the word analog two or three times and i was using the word logic two or three times and these are kind of opposite words um no i don't think so analog in my mind analog means that um that everything, every bit uh, can build in a little bit uh, and, and push the system one way to another. I see. Uh, so, but when you say bit, you mean that it is discontinuous, it's just that there are many steps. Um, um, well, if you, if you watch the, the memory potential in the cell, it is continuous. But if you it's watch analog. the output of the axon, it's discontinuous. I agree. The output of the axon is this. Another thing it's, that worries me very much. It's the central <laughs> limit theorem of, uh, of the neuroscience. You add up lots of little things, and then you get something that looks smooth, right? That's why you get Gaussian distributions everywhere. I mean, I don't know. That's the some of it. That's that is the bridge, and in, some of it's yeah. like what you're talking about is another level between this, right? So with normal rate coding, you just have a whole bunch of inputs coming in and then you add them up and then you get more or less depolarization and then you just have one level uh, and then you somehow put it to the threshold and how that gets organized. But now you have something that's in between, right? Like a mesoscale of, of combinations of adding things up and then they interact you still have the other scale, and then they interact in some common, you know, some complicated way between these plateau-type depolarizations, and then all you also have all the adding up of all the individual other little things, right? And so now you just have another thing in between, just adding everything up. So can I write out an equation that represents the thing you just said and see what it would do? I mean, what good it would be? Because if, it, if it's just a neuron that adds up all of its excitation and subtracts all of its inhibition and then fires at some rate that represents the difference between those, then, uh, then I, I really don't see how you can make an interesting machine out of those. Well, you have to have lots of neurons that are connected in, in complicated ways, right? Uh, so if you make it up that way, if it's just a rate, then it, you smear out, you lose a lot of time, right? You can't do particular, well, I don't know what the time scale of the rate response is in that way. But it's one of the issues, the flip side of thinking about any of these schemes. So you think of for, for the neuron, what do they respond to? It's like, well, how does it get all organized? Like who, what combination of synapses is clustered and which combination of synapses is large? even if there aren't clustering, right? So you still have this neuron is receiving from specific patterns of other neurons, not just a whole bunch of random axons. And that's how you would do something. I guess. So that's the dilemma of the neuro, 
anatomist. So I actually, I, I did some neuroanatomy for a while, and one of the things that I like to do is fill neurons with some dye and then follow their axons and to another part of the brain. And when I first started doing it, I had the completely naive idea that when you looked, you'd see that the axon was going over and making some synapses on this neuron, and would go over and make some synapses on that neuron, and would go over and make some synapses on that neuron. And then you'd find another axon that went to this neuron, but not to that one, and went to this one in between. But that's not what you see most of the time, especially in the forebrain. What you see is the axon goes in to that place and does exactly the thing you say axons don't do, which is just spray out and go all over the place, and you can't see any pattern to it at all. Now, you can imagine there's a pattern that you cannot see. It's outside <laughs> the domain of your data. See it's that familiar. even though it looks like just a mess, that there's actually some order to all that. And if you could see it, this neuron and that neuron and that neuron would be converging to here, and this one and that one and that one would be converging to here. But finding that in the data is uh, uh, not something I was able, ever able to do. So the, so the, um, so I think that sort of street talk about neurons among neuroscientists who aren't, who don't worry about this stuff all the time in their lives, uh, people who are studying like neural correlates of behavior or something like that, is just a little bit like what you said. It's like every, every neuron is getting tons of data from all kinds of different things. It's mostly unrelated. When it, there's some kind of, um, coherence in it, the neuron will fire an action potential, and that the, all of the meaning of that is embedded in the connectivity, in the axonal projection patterns that I could never see in my experiments. And so you're like passing the buck entirely over to anatomy, and the anatomy has never given you what you wanted. And so maybe what's needed is to figure out how to do the anatomy better so that you could see that stuff if it's really there. Okay, but another approach that people are using today is record as many cells as possible at the same time, which can perhaps help you answer, number one, what is the functional anatomy? Because if do, two cells are correlated, probably there's, a fu there's an anatomy to allow that. There's an axon going forward, right? that's mm -hmm. one. Another thing that would uh, recording from many neurons at the same time help is trying to find the logic of, uh, of many cells firing at the same time. And, uh, and, and when I, I want to think in the most simplistic terms, and I think in simplistic terms when I accept the, the idea that uh, neural ensembles are important, so that one neural ensemble, which involves millions of cells firing at the same moment of time, provides you with an idea, provides you with an idea of uh, one thought, one object, one feeling, one situation, one memory, one context, and then when another another ensemble of cells fires, you are in a different object, different idea, different context, and um, now the brain is an analog machine because it only needs to determine one thing: which ensemble wins. So it's a win or lose situation. The, once the disassemble wins, you are in that part of the thought, or you're that feeling, or you have an idea of, of this color, of the, and then another ensemble wins, you change the, 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 the you, you move to the next thought. So, but how do you move from one regime to the other, building an ensemble versus evoking an ensemble? And that, because in this idea, the duration of the, of the plateau allows you to sort of build the ensemble, is the way I was imagining it. But then inputs coming in become permissive based on how that ensemble is configured. And then you may have another set of inputs overtaking and making that ensemble override the plateau. I mean, I can, can you just sort of All talk right. through so, some of that? So to explain for people who are watching this and they didn't come to the lecture, um, the, the simple part of the theory is that you have a class of objects that will trigger a depolarization based on the clustering on, on a dendrite. And that class of objects will uh, provide inputs to a uh, group of cells, not all of them. Only those cells that, that, uh, that fire with that type of uh, object. So, so that means that uh, when 
for some reason, sensory input that is signaling a car, right? So a class of object car is active. You have neurons in the upstate that are responsible for coding for a car. If the sensory input now changes and codes for a fruit, that's a completely different cell that I'm in a prepared state. So this 200 to 500 millisecond window that you mentioned in the paper that is... Uh, 200 is a very narrow uh, definition. It can go... The, 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 polarized, the polarized state based on glutamate can go anywhere between 100 and, uh, and 1,000 milliseconds with no problem. So the way I was thinking about it is it defines an envelope of time it for does. which you can sort of synchronize and build the ensemble, right? But evoking the ensemble is a totally different operation. I agree. Right? So now that you have cells in the prepared state, where there is an a association that uh, that the brain is trying to think about uh, about a specific item that belongs to that class, so a specific fruit that belongs to the class of of fruit, uh, you rely or you rely on these distributed inputs that give the feature of the fruit. What is the shape? What is the color? What is the taste? And, and now those, because they're weak, they're not as strong as a clustered input, because they're weak, they, they require a cell to be in the polarized state in order to, to, to trigger firing. So when that changes, you lose that ensemble. If the specific information is no longer available, you lose that ensemble. And if the class object information is not available, you're no longer capable of, doing, of coding for that. I mean, these are speculations that, that I try to to, to work on uh, from, I mean, I try to start from. That's what I wanted to say. This is what we have to do, I think, to understand how neurons work. If we just start saying that neurons do all the things we've seen them do in our experiments, they have EPSPs and IPSPs, and they fire action potentials, and there's a relationship between the membrane potential and the action potential generation, uh, we end up with this story we can tell our students about how neurons work we can't explain how neurons do anything interesting. And like, for example, identify an object. And so for that, we need to, we rely on uh, information that comes from sort of cognitive, from a more cognitive point of view, like the categorical nature of knowledge. And then we try to use combinations of these categories to build things that might be thoughts or the same thing happens with movement. The movement is exactly um, parallel to this. So movements are, uh, are categorical and have to be made of categorical things. But when we actually look at the motor system, we don't see categories. We just see neurons firing when they get some input. So we have to somehow fill in the gap between what we think are the, the way that the mind works and the way the neuron works. So, since the, the system is so incredible, there's no doubt that, uh, number one, you need to develop these theories that are based on theoretical thinking. Number two, you need to record from as many neurons as possible, right, under strict behavioral conditions. And number three, you need to collect the connectome data. So, you need to know, for example, what is the likelihood of your cells being projected to, uh, to uh, one, another cell in that region and the other cell in that region. And then when you combine all the elements, there's going to be probably a, a group of smart people that can uh, develop new and better theories than the current, the one that we have. Yeah. But you now people, people agree that this is going to be based on, on recording from any cells, doing the anatomy, connectum, and behavior. And that's what people are doing. Time to get to work then, should we call it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that sounds like a good way to end. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Sujan. Um, it's been Neuroscientist Talk Shop.